discussion about stuff I'm going to talk about, and hopefully I'll hit some of what everybody has claimed I'm going to say. There's some pieces that I'm probably not quite going to touch on, although we will have, uh, once we get through all of us having spoken, we're going to have some breakout sessions, and so there may be some opportunities to hit some of those details. Um, I was introduced as being a really smart guy with a PhD and stuff like that and doing tactical uh, uh, medicine, which I have gotten into, but I actually ended up involved in tactical medicine because of these firearm injury concerns. So if you would have spoken to me four years ago, um, here I'll put up my, my, my disclosure slide. I was doing all this engineering stuff with Georgia Tech medical device development, and then one day I was actually talking to Lauren who uh, I'm going to embarrass her a little bit, had been a medical student with us and then a resident with us and then was a few years into being faculty and I learned that she was interested in firearm injury prevention and as she was describing her interests, um, that's what I said to her. Okay, that's great that you want to work in this field, just don't say stupid stuff. And that turned into a longer conversation about what I meant by that. And so initially it was in writing papers in this area, don't make silly mistakes like calling a uh, magazine a clip, right? Because classically we've seen groups like the NRA will go after folks writing in this field and go, oh, they don't know about guns, they called it a clip. Well, you go to a gun range and everybody calls a magazine a clip. It just happens. But it is technically wrong. So that was where we sort of started the conversation. But as we started delving into what the actual needs in this field, both in terms of overarching knowledge and what we should be doing as providers in working to help our patients, um, there were quite a few other don't say stupid stuff issues that came up. Uh, and that sort of led me on a little bit of a personal quest to try to figure out how to not say stupid stuff. So out of everything on here, yes, I've got a lot of engineering stuff, but way down here at the bottom, I've actually gone to the point of actually becoming an NRA, NRA certified uh, instructor. I'm actually currently a cadet in uh, our, one of our county's police academies uh, because I've been working with the SWAT team. And that all came out of this process of figuring out how to meet our patients where they are and have a foundation of knowledge, both to be able to talk to patients as well as participate in educating our colleagues, our medical students, our residents about these important issues. So I'm going to tell a little bit of a personal story and what you'll find, unlike most of the other speakers here, most of what I'm telling you is not evidence-based. It is my personal experience and what I've learned to sort of get to this point and be able to contribute. Um, I grew up in a family that my parents were members of just about every anti-gun, pro-gun control organization that you have ever or never heard of, all right? And then when I was about 15 years old, I got my first girlfriend who, um, I, think, I think she was right there. Um, and she was a near Olympic level shooter. Uh, and she picked me up. She said, you're the least nerdy guy on the chess team. And I want to learn how to play chess. If you teach me how to play chess, I will teach you how to shoot. And at that point in my life, I had never held, touched, fired a firearm. And uh, we were in a public high school. And I started going to the public high school's rifle club towards the end of my sophomore year. And about six weeks later, I made the varsity rifle team. All right. Part of that, I believe, is because I was so uncertain about firearms that I just did exactly what they told me to do. I followed all the rules, and of course, I had a girlfriend to impress, and you know that always motivates people a little bit. Uh, the interesting thing about that is the coach of our team, actually, his day job was he was an NRA spokesperson. And that kind of opened my eyes to a whole nother way of thinking about firearms than anything that I had ever really heard of or been exposed to before. So that was in 1991. I spent two years on the varsity rifle team. Uh, my parents, although very much passionate about being pro-gun control, anti-gun, actually bought me this rifle, which for two years I brought to school with me three to four days a week because that's when the practices were. So my parents sort of came to the understanding that shooting sports are athletic actual athletic competitions, that there are opportunities. They basically said, well, we bought you a clarinet, and you're not very good at playing that, and you know, we thought you might get a college scholarship, and apparently the shooting stuff you're actually good at, so we should probably support that as well. 
Uh, I then went about 20 years without being involved in shooting in any particular form. Uh, and then uh, you know, here I am with my kids. And my son entered um, the Boy Scout programs, now Scouts BSA. And our troop has an annual trip out to a shooting range. And I was kind of interested in going and realized I had this rifle in storage. And I took it out of storage, refurbished it, which my daughter, who's uh, in that picture as well, was very interested in that process. And when I came back from that trip, she pretty much met me at the door and said, Daddy, when are you going to teach me how to shoot? It was an interesting moment to have. Um, the other piece of that, coming back from that trip, I was very aware on that trip that for the most part, most of the kids, as they were learning about safe handling and firing of firearms, followed all the rules and did a pretty good job of understanding the safety component. The people who scared me were the kids that there were guns in the home and more importantly, the parents. All right, those were the folks that I saw grossly mishandling firearms to the point where I actually stood up and kicked another parent off of the ranch. All right? They had their finger on the trigger. They weren't paying attention to whether the firearm was loaded. Um, the instructors there didn't spot it. And I actually stood up and kicked them off the ranch. The other thing that kind of rubbed me the wrong way is the opening session, we're doing our safety briefing, and one of the instructors walks out and goes, gentlemen, this is Georgia, right? Gentlemen, we're uh, here today to exercise our Second Amendment rights. And a little alarm bell went off in my mind because that's not what the scout program is about in terms of shooting sports, nor is it the right priority when talking to kids about firearms. The emphasis, and in fact, I will tell you, having gone through the NRA course, and yes, I'm an NRA instructor, no, I am not a member of the NRA, but what we are supposed to say when we run an NRA course in that introduction is gentlemen or ladies or whoever's in the course, we're here today to learn the knowledge, skills, and attitudes necessary for safe handling of a firearm, right? Not the Second Amendment, that's all the way out in chapter eight or nine. Yes, they tell me I'm supposed to teach people all about that, get your guns, but that's not until after you've gone through the instruction about safe handling uh, and ownership. Um, so all of that kind of came together all at kind of one time. Ultimately, my decision with my daughter was that having a child who was interested in learning about shooting was the opportunity to teach her about safety. Uh, only there's a little bit of a challenge of how you teach an eight-year-old when you live in an urban environment about shooting. You can't just go out in the backyard and start shooting. You can't go to a commercial range. I actually customized an air gun to actually be able to teach her both safe handling skills as well as shooting fundamentals. And that way, in one fell swoop, we could take away some of that curiosity about what happens when you pull the trigger and actually get her to learn the basic uh, shooting fundamentals. Uh, so that's sort of been my little personal uh, voyage through all of this. Uh, but in all of this, sort of what kept on coming up is that in this space, there's a lot of stuff that most of us, particularly if you're coming from more of a pro-gun control, anti-gun standpoint, we simply don't know. And that often gets in our way in terms of being able to address patients uh, appropriately. And for those of you who are of more of a political bent, um, you know, I will also say what you don't know is also going to get in your way in terms of being able to advocate for policy things that make sense that will actually potentially do what you intend to do. So among the things that I think that many folks don't know about and probably should know about is what are the safe handling and storage techniques? What are different types of firearms and ammunition? What does that mean? What are the safety features? How do you even purchase a gun? And some of these things start getting into things that are highly variable on a state-to-state -state basis. Um, ammunition. So I'm in Georgia. There's very little uh, restrictions. I can literally go to a website, plunk down my credit card number, and have somebody drop an ammunition on the front step of my house. All right. There are other states where it's a little bit more complicated. Issues like concealed carry. These are all things that you have to understand what the local laws are uh, and uh, what they mean. And what I find is when people get up and give a lecture about these things, it's often a little bit challenging for me to remember all of the details, particularly when it's nuanced. Uh, so I took the approach that I prefer, which is learning by doing. So obviously, a big motivation on all of this is that 
we take care of gunshot victims, all right? And we're at Grady where we see on average three to four gunshot victims per day. Um, so there's a lot of knowledge that comes out of that experience. But I started taking classes, uh, in fact, proceeded then to take instructor classes. I went down to the courthouse, figured out the process to actually apply for a weapons permit. Uh, I purchased a firearm. And actually, then I purchased another one after having my concealed carry permit because it changes in Georgia how that process works. Uh, I've spent an awful lot of time with other firearm owners, which has been really quite educational in terms of understanding beyond the politics, people's attitudes and feelings about their guns. Uh, and at this point, the going to the police academy, being a part of a SWAT team, also has uh, been highly eye-opening. Uh, and then a big part of what I've been trying to do now is sort of share some of uh, that knowledge and opportunity. Um, so engagement with the firearm community, and you've heard that across all of our speakers, we're talking about a problem with the larger context, particularly suicide, where who gets injured by firearms? By and large, it is firearm owners. And particularly in this political climate, if we're going to create policy or other types of solutions, to address firearm uh, injury, it's very clear that engagement with the firearm community is going to be critical. Okay, all right. Um, and certainly, as you've heard, there are a lot of areas that if we can distance ourselves from the politics, there is clearly common ground between those of us who'd like to reduce firearm injury as well as the firearm community. So I want to kind of touch on some basic things that I think that everybody who wants to work with patients and get into this space uh, really needs to know. So the first thing is the firearm safety rules. So how many of you know firearm safety rules? Okay. So the problem here is there are actually a lot of firearm safety rules. Um, and I would argue that if you want to be able to talk to patients, you need to know one set of the rules really, really well, and then be aware of the other rules that are out there. Um, I tend to gravitate towards the NRA's rules because to me they actually make the most sense. It's easy to remember, there are three always is. So if here's my gun, I've got to point my gun in a safe direction, right? That sounds good. Keeping my finger off the trigger until ready to fire, and then keeping the firearm unloaded until ready to use, right? Most unintentional injuries shouldn't happen if you can just follow those rules. Now, of course, it's a little bit more complicated than that, and if you dig deeper, well, the NRA has eight more rules as well. Um, so knowing your target and what's beyond, knowing how to use your gun, making sure your gun is actually safe, using the correct ammunition, wearing eye and ear protection, not using alcohol and drugs, correct storage, uh, and then being aware that specific gun shooting sports and other things actually require additional rules. All right, so probably not going to remember all of that, but the three always is, are pretty good. Uh, for those of you who raised your hands about knowing gun safety rules, uh, these are the main ones that people talk about, the Ten Commandments of Gun Safety. Um, one that's particularly popular is the Jeff Cooper's four rules. Uh, my favorite one on there is number two. Never let the muzzle cover anything you're not willing to destroy, right? It has a certain resonance in there of the severity of making an error with the firearm. Uh, the United States Marine Corps uh, firearm and weapon rules is also one that commonly comes up. And these are all things, they are all variations on the same sets of rules, um, but it's something to be aware of. And depending on how training is being done in your community, you may see that different sets of these rules are a lot more popular. But the general principles of don't point the gun at anything that shouldn't be getting shot, keeping that finger away from a trigger, and keeping guns unloaded are sort of a good core basic. Um, so the next thing that, that I think is important to understand is knowing these rules actually sometimes lets you directly address a patient. So one of the things that got me a little bit motivated on the patient side about this was seeing a lot of patients who had unintentionally shot themselves. So who's seen a patient who's unintentionally shot themselves in the left leg? All right. It should be about half of the unintentional gunshot wounds that you see. Um, and this is something that you knowing these rules actually allows you to get to a teachable moment. 
All right, so what is the most commonly uh, owned brand of handgun in the United States? Glock, okay? Glock's headquarters is in, in Smyrna, Georgia. Um, and there is a little issue with Glocks that's really handy if you remember it in having conversations. So we have our three rules. So the common situation for that gunshot wound in the left leg is that the person has taken their handgun and they're about to disassemble it for cleaning. Okay, so they've got their gun in their hand and in order to disassemble a Glock, you actually have to pull the trigger. All right, so one of those three rules you have to violate in order to field strip a Glock. But what you remember right away is, well, they pulled the trigger, so they had to do that, but was at their leg a safe direction? No, all right? And did they check to see if the firearm was fully unloaded? Probably not if it went bang. So this is one of those little things. It's a very small bit of knowledge but if you're aware of it, being able to talk to a patient who has shot themselves and say, so do you have a Glock? You know, were you trying to field strip it? Immediately gives you a little bit of credibility in talking in this space. Working yourself through having that conversation often is a helpful way to overcome some of that barrier if I don't really feel comfortable um, talking about this or knowing about this. I'm going to briefly jump through uh, talking about hands-on sessions and range sessions so I can talk a little bit about what we're doing this afternoon. Um, the whole idea of hands-on sessions is there's just only so much we can do on PowerPoints. There's some of this that's much more understandable. If you can hold the firearm in your hand, that means we need appropriate level of supervision and instruction. Um, and it also means there's an opportunity since that now means you're probably going to a range of going through the process of firing and learning more. Um, the challenge there is, is that sometimes you can put off your learners if you're pushing the shooting side of things, uh, although we've had reasonably good success in creating these sessions and bringing folks in. Um, when you get out to the range, having appropriate supervision is always going to be critical, even if it was complete novices, uh, not complete novices. Um, so there I am on the range wearing my, I don't think I'm wearing the instructor hat, but doing some teaching. When we have people handling firearms, it really needs to be one-on-one -on -one instruction. And interestingly, even at a place like a police academy, while we're doing drills there, it is often one-on-one -on -one instruction. Um, the key topics to cover, uh, the types of firearms, so having a variety to look at, uh, covering the safety principles, both having that as a PowerPoint and demonstrating. Here's a gun. Notice how I'm holding it. Notice how before we brought the guns into the room, we had two people check and make sure they're actually all unloaded. These are all things that we can reinforce the key elements while we're doing the sessions. Covering things like types of ammunition, field stripping, holstering, carry methods, safe storage and locks, these are all critical topics. Um, when we get out to the range doing a safety briefing to review all the rules, doing some demo firing so that learners understand what's going to happen before we're potentially having them hold a loaded weapon uh, is important. I think that ideally there's at least four weapons that most people should handle. So a rifle and or a shotgun, a semi-automatic handgun, uh, and a revolver is sort of the bare minimum. Uh, obviously, there are a lot of different types beyond that. Um, we found in our session that actually making ballistics gel and firing ammunition through ballistics gel was really helpful to our learners to understand actually what the difference is when a round hits tissue, uh, what all that means. So here's a picture from our range day. We worked with the Fulton County Police Department, which was a great thing in that it greatly reduced the cost. The police provided the instructors, the target, the ammunition, the firearms, pretty much everything. So it really only cost us about $10 per person, and that was the cost of making ballistics gels and a couple of other incidental costs. What we're going to do today is probably a little bit easier thing to organize. Uh, through the uh, Las Vegas Police Department, I found uh, one of the medics. They have a side company that they do uh, tactical education. Um, and so at a cost of about $150 per person, we just contracted and said, here's our list of learning objectives. Find us the range, find the instructors, 
tell us what to do and we're going to go out into the desert and get it done. Obviously, there are ways of doing this sort of training that are somewhat in between uh, in terms of cost uh, that may have a little more, a little bit less requirements for an individual to take on as being the instructor for it. 